do this. Gary Kennedy, welcome to the Mapper Forward podcast. How are you, sir? Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Map It Forward podcast. Oh, look, I'm a returning speaker. <laughs> You're a returning star as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome also to everybody who's joining us. This is an interactive episode of the podcast. You are welcome to enter all of your questions into the live chat. And as Gary and I chat, we're going to drop those questions in through the conversation. Uh, for anyone who didn't uh, listen to the first episode, the first time that Gary came on, you missed out big time because it was an incredible conversation and Gary thank you again for all the wisdom that you imparted onto us as an industry uh, it was the most listened to podcast of the last 12 months so thank you so much so I'll give you a little bit a little spiel on me that didn't come out last time because people said, oh, here's Gary who works in the coffee industry. I really don't. <laughs> no. Um, I'm a, no, I'm a, you know, I, I do have no people. I do have coffee clients. Um, I'm really a food safety, food technologist. Right. And in fact, most of my work would be done in the high risk food service area and high risk manufacturing. So in Australia, I deal with some of the more iconic brand names you have over there. So, for example, KFC, McDonald's, Taco Bell mm -hmm. are all clients of mine in Australia, as is Coca-Cola. Um, they're all brand names that I deal with over here. Um, I suppose the organisation I'm supposed to be most involved in in the last couple of weeks is I'm the advisor, food safety advisor and infection control in food safety advisor to the New South Wales Health Department. Wow. So that's the state of Australia that includes Sydney for the Americans listening. So um, I've been advising how they handle food safety and serving of hospital patients with COVID-19 um, during this crisis. And also talking to the big fast food chains. What do they do with their staff? What do they do with people coming in? I suppose it's getting to be a bit of a moot point as there's no dining in restaurants in Australia anymore. Um, it's all only takeaway or drive through over here at Have the moment. Have they officiated that yet? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so people like McDonald's are only do and KFC are only doing drive through um, or you can't go into the restaurant, you ring up and they take it to the door of the restaurant. Um, we've shut all cafes, um, all outdoor dining is closed in Australia and only takeaway is allowed from a bit like I believe New York's done. We've and got LA, that throughout the LA the same. And, yeah, we've done it throughout oh, sorry, the whole California. of Australia. Yeah, all of Australia has done that. Which the whole of America should be doing that. The whole of the world should be looking at doing that right now. We want to talk about, actually, let's start with New Zealand and the measures that they've taken with regards to, as far as from what I can see, they're the best case of what we all should have done having had the heads up that they had. In New Zealand, I think, is the benchmark for the world. And right. there are similar countries you know, if you're in Ireland, like the UK, Ireland, Australia, which unfortunately the United States is not, no. but Hawaii has this option, for example. New Zealand last night at midnight has gone into total full lockdown, the entire country for a month. You are not allowed to go outside your house except for a little bit of exercise a day. You have to be on your own. They've shut down every non-essential business. So, for example jewelers, clothing stores, Kmart, you know, liquor stores. The entire country has shut for a month and no one's being allowed in or out of the country. And so the idea is you stay at home with your family and if you've got it 14 days, then you infect them and only them mm -hmm. and then they've got 14 days to get over it. So within a month's time, New Zealand should be free of COVID-19 or new cases of COVID-19. And then it'll only be people coming into the country who are going to bring it in. And that's, you know, you look at kind of like what China did at the beginning. And I keep saying this, but, and I'd love to know if you agree with me. We're so lucky it started in China. Yes. 
Yes. Look, had this started in Bangladesh or Uganda or something like that, where there are, dare I, as horrible as it sounds, where there isn't that political government where they weld your door shut to keep you <laughs> <Right>. in. <laughs> yeah. And we, we saw that on the news. Um then, yeah, this would have been a much, much, much quicker, um, far wider spread, far more quickly than it was. Um, the fact that it's now starting, you know, it's in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, um, Pakistan, uh, the middle of Africa, where you have some very, very concentrated populations with very, vo very poor health systems is a real worry for all of us. I would expect we're going to see deaths from this potentially in the millions. Yeah. I mean, people keep saying over here, like, you know, the president even is saying over here that by Easter we should be open as a country again. He's dreaming. Fact, yeah, fat chance, no hope in hell. No. Well, let, let me say, in my opinion, no hope in hell, you know, from the other side of the earth. Um, he... If, if that's adopted, he will be responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. Um, it just will be spread incredibly. Um, the, the, your health system won't be able to cope. Look, America hospitals are brilliant hospitals. With you, in that sense, you have a great health system, but no one can afford to go to them. Yes. So if you're, <laughs> you're, if you're sick and you can't go to hospital, you'll just spread it around your community. Mm. Um, it you know, not only is it people going about their normal lives, you know, this will get into people like the the homeless population and things like that. It'll oh. continue to spread. Have you heard about what's going on in LA and their predictions for Skid Row? Yeah, I assume most of them will go. They're, um, they're, trying, they're buying hotels right now, outright buying hotels. This is the governor. Uh, they've secured 1,900 rooms and they're hoping to put the homeless in those rooms. However, the problem is you've got upwards of 70,000 homeless people. That's just in Skid Row. You've got to find rooms for all of those people and they anticipate if they stay together, the, the rate could get as high because of the hygiene problems, uh, could get as high as 50% death rate. Yeah. One of your problems in the homeless, because I live in the, if you know, you know Sydney yeah. Leap, um, I, my office is in Surrey Hills, one of the very inner city suburbs. Mm. Um, it has a lot of homeless shelters. It, it is mm. a, traditionally a very poor area. Now, like a lot of cities, it's partly up market and partly incredibly down market. <laughs> yes. And um, like a lot of inner city suburbs. And, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of the mental ill, a lot of the homeless, um, a lot of the destitute still live in this suburb. A lot of those people do not have the mental faculties, let alone mm. the money to be able to get good medical care. I mean, they literally live on the streets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walking around today for the first time in two weeks was really interesting to see the difference between people who you could very clearly see were taking it seriously and other people who gave zero care about the whole thing. I had a guy spit as he was running past me right in front of my feet. And I'm like, mm. part of me wonders, did he do that without thinking or does he just not care? Does he just want to – this is not a time where you can't care. Mm. And for most of us – this will be, you know, this will be a bad flu. In fact, a good proportion of us won't even realise we've got it. Mm. But for the elderly, and there we're talking 70 above, or we're talking the immunocompromised, and we'll talk in a sec what that is, the immunocompromised and the age, at least in our country, 35% of the populations are vulnerable to this yeah. um, and could die from it. Now, the immunocompromised is people think, oh, that's the drug addicts, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's anyone whose immune system down. You know, that is people who have got angina. It's people recovering from stroke. It's people Transplant. on antibiotics yeah. treatment, transplants. It's people with HIV. Mm -hmm. It's everyone with severe, di so diabetes 1 and diabetes 2. Which is um, huge a, in this country. It's huge, huge here in this country. Oh. 
and growing exponentially. In Australia, it's roughly 35% of the population is either elderly or immunocompromised. Yeah. And they're incredibly vulnerable. If they get if they get this, they're far more likely to be hospitalised or die. That's the reason they're trying to, what they call in Australia, flatten the curve. Are they using the same terminology oh, over big there? Time. Yeah, yeah. And we've, yeah. we've explained it over here, but go ahead and explain it again. Well, basically... Well, let's use the Italians as probably, unfortunately, the best example. Um, Italy didn't put in good controls initially, and the Italian population, as we know why we go there, narrow streets, lots of apartments, all living on top of each other. So when the disease got in there, it spread extremely rapidly through those rap narrow streets. So what happened is a whole lot of people in northern Italy all got ill together. Mm. There's not enough beds for them. There's not enough ventilators for them because there's this rapid spike in the amount of people getting sick. And so the in some of the hospitals are saying, if you've got COVID-19 and you're 60 years or older, we're going to let you die. Yeah. There, is no, there is no hospital bed for you. So wow. in... The countries who are trying to flatten the curve, what? so basically Italy is trying to save the young people because they've still got a life ahead of them and let the old people die, which is just horrible. So in America and Australia, flattening the curve is trying to get – I saw that. That was in the elbow. It that was, was well done. <laughs> Listen, so, when you're trained as a scientist in this shit, you just have to do one immunology class no matter at what point it happens in your life. And for me, it was 20 years ago. I have become a germaphobe since then and cough into my, sh my shoulder and my elbow since I was a kid was at university because it scares the shit out of me. Germs just scare the shit out of me. We'll get back to flatten the curve Sorry. in a second. I've got, a, I've got no, no, we'll, we, no, no, no. I've got a similar <laughs> analogy. Um, I've got a, my degree includes food microbiology uh -huh. and basic microbiology, you know, and virology. And uh, um, I'm older and was around for the HIV, HIV epidemic. Wow. Um, and so I, I remember when that first started, my basic knowledge of microbiology and virology, I just went, <laughs> eh, and I was basically celibate. Yeah, I was going to say, you just <laughs> never want to have sex again. <laughs> no, 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 no. It probably <laughs> saved my life, yeah. you yeah, know. Yeah. In, the, in that period, because, you know, unfortunately, I lived through that period and I did go to a number of funerals of friends around that time. And I thank the fact that my degree was in microbiology yes. probably did save my life. I, same reaction you had with your scientific knowledge. I had the same reaction. Yeah. I was actually working in public health at the time. I was working for a public hospital and I went to one of the in-class lectures that they had on that disease and when the first case had appeared in Australia and they actually said, when this turns up our hospital, we're going to lock them away and let them die because we don't know how to deal with it. And we'll just isolate them and let them die. And I just thought, well, there's no way I want to catch this. No, it basically no. did not do much for the next couple of years. No. Anyway, can, can, can I just read you a comment about flattening the curve? So as I said, yep. we've got the live chat going. And shout out to Roger. Roger has written something that is so utterly disturbing not about Roger about something that he's told us he said first of all thanks to both of us for being here and then says apparently there's a game where teenagers have to cough in an elder's face and run what the fuck is wrong with them we had the first arrest in Australia. Yes, that's happened in Australia. You would know the, the town of Coffs Harbour in yeah, New yeah. South Wales. There was an arrest yesterday. We had the first very publicised arrest for exactly that, a YouTube game where a man went into a police station and coughed in the desk sergeant's face um, and has been arrested because of that and they publicized it and that it was being filmed by a friend to put it up on one of the um, internet channels you know like my degree was in genetics and I feel like the same fuckers that do this bullshit belong in the same category as the fuckers who eat Tide Pods this is Darwinian Darwinism at its best like let 
this shit take care of itself. Natural selection should wipe these fuckers out. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Put them all on that island where they put the AIDS patient and let them all cough on each other. Yeah. Yes. Like, uh, Roger's saying the Irish Minister of Health had to deal with a teenager yesterday because he coughed on his face and ran. This is just negligence and uh, at its worst. Like, what do people think of it? they're going to achieve by this? I really, I, I get that they just think it's stupid. Where are these people's parents? Do I sound like an old person now? Uh, they very publicly in Australia, this was a major news story. They actually showed his face on TV. They said what his name was. They showed him in handcuffs being led away and they arrested his friend who was taking the footage and they're being criminally charged. And they should be. Mm. Wow. So they, it, it has happened here <laughs> and they're being very clear on it over here that they will arrest you. This is considered assault where, and if you do have it, up to and including manslaughter charges can be laid on you. They're being very public about it here. And they should be. And, I mean, hmm. the one thing that I've noticed, uh, you know, we talk about flattening the curve and, and the whole point of that is how do we decrease the incidences of this and slow it down? From yeah, we slow it. The idea is to slow it down to the extent that there is still enough hospital beds and ventilators that the amount of people getting sick and having to go to hospital, there's still a hospital bed for them. Right. So that we don't have the Italian situation where everyone turns up at the hospital at once and basically people are told you're going to die. We don't have a bed for you. In, um, in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo was saying yesterday that they sent him a 1,000 respirators or 400 and something respirators. I can't remember what it was. And he said, I need 20,000 respirators. Mm. And that's to saw, start with. Yes, we saw your president make the comment of you should have ordered them three years ago when you had the opportunity. That made the news here. I want to talk about leadership in that because, yes. you know, it's, it's in times of these very extreme circumstances that leadership understands that the best way to say that this is you can either feed hype and be one of those leaders that creates more anxiety or you can be one of those leaders that goes and finds out the information and manages people's expectations with the truth. And I think that the WHO is doing a great job of that. Yes, I think so too. I think that our governor here, Governor Newsom, is doing a fantastic job of that. I think the exceptional job is being done by Jacinta Ardern, um, in New the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I heard a comment today on the Joe Rogan podcast where he said, Right now, it's the leaders who have put the time into building their character and making very clear what their character is. They're the leaders who are really showing up. They're the ones who are going and speaking to the scientists and finding out what the truth is and not spreading any kind of information that isn't true. As a scientist, that must be helpful to you as somebody who has information that is advising people as opposed to dealing with leaders who are all about hype and excitement and how do I cause drama? I mean, you're advising some of the most important decision makers with regards to this right now in Australia. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. And um, there's only it's, – it's really odd, you know. You know, I'm – you know, I'm – don't think of myself as some, what I am at the moment, in that sense. I've done interviews on both Channel, 7, uh, Channel 9 and Channel 10 here. So imagine that I'm on the nightly news on CBS and NBC. Yeah. That's that's the equivalent. Um, I'm on ABC Radio. Which, which is I like NPR is in, here. Yeah, NPR. Um, I'm, I've done a lecture. I've done this podcast for the food technologist. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'm doing it for the hospital caterers. We've got over 300 hospitals online listening to this. I don't know how I, I know. I don't know how I became the expert, if that makes a sense. I think everyone is looking for someone to say, 
here's the information that's out here. I will say a, a bonus point to our Prime Minister here. You know, you would be well known over, I, it probably made the news over there that during the bushfires, where he Australia was on fire, our Bush, our Prime Minister was on holiday in Hawaii um, and said he didn't need to come back because we were dealing with it. And he got really hounded for that. Can I say in this, he's doing a good job. One thing they've done really well here is they've got our state and territory. So if you like the state governors mm -hmm. and the prime minister are meeting every day by teleconference discussing it and they're televising parts of those meetings. So every single day we've got every state governor and the prime minister, your president, having a teleconference to discuss what's happening and what the outcomes are and what the changes and recommendations are. So in that sense, we have a unity ticket, which is incredibly unusual, like it is in America, to have all the parties agreeing on one right. common action. Do you not think that they're late to the game, though? Uh, yeah, they should have been doing this earlier. In February, at least, at the latest, yes. at the latest. Yes. I mean, last week in Australia, we had a cruise boat offload 2,700 passengers oh, in Sydney. I heard about that. Um, it, yeah, it's now known that 136 of those passengers had COVID-19. One died just after getting off the boat, and the rest of them are spread throughout the whole country. Um, so there's still mistakes being made. Wow. We've got a question from Brett. Brett said, where is the most credible source of scientific information coming from regarding this outbreak? Is it the WHO or is it something else? WHO. Right. The World Health Organization. Um, if for no other reason, they're independent of any government. Right. And how they are, are they funded? Uh, via the United Nations. It's a division of the United Nations. Right. So in, in that sense, it's about politics. Which is fantastic. I mean, at, at this time, we really need somebody who is just telling us what we need to know, not the agenda that they want us to hear, which is what hap is happening with government right now. Right now, yes. government is like this is this whole thing that Trump's doing with regards to the country's going to be up and running by Easter you know, that's a political agenda, whereas the WHO doesn't have that. Yes, and some other countries haven't. Look, some of the Pacific Islands, you know, places like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Fiji, because they're islands and remote, they were very early on to this and they said, oh, it's not here yet, fine, we're stopping all tourism, we're stopping yeah. all visitors. So there are, when they're talking the number of countries with this disease, some of the remote Pacific islands, uh, the smaller countries, I mean, their entire industry, the only viable industry they got is tourism, and they said, we are going to stop tourism in order to stop this at our borders. So we have seen some particularly, look, it's difficult in America because you've got Canada and Mexico. You know, you've got borders, which have since been closed, but... Some of the islands, some of you know, for someone like the Prime Minister of Tuvalu, which is a very, very poor country, to say no more tourists, and right. we're not letting, and we're not letting any person from Tuvalu go overseas anymore, because um, the other source of income for places like Vanuatu and Tuvalu is they come to places like Australia and pick fruit and yeah. do casual jobs. Then they take so the they money said, back. None of, yeah, none of our citizens are going out of the country and no one's coming in. So we will find some countries where COVID-19 has never got in, some of the more remote ones. If you're an island nation, you're like, heaven, you know, Cuba, you know, somewhere yeah. like that, this should be containable. You should be able to get rid of this if more you get readily than the United States. Yeah, if you get in early, like some of the Pacific Islands did, and sort of New Zealand does now. New Zealand's still only got a just over 100 cases. Have they got any deaths yet? I can't remember if I... No, there's not. A, I don't believe there's a death in New Zealand That's yet. That's fantastic. You've got a very, very lovely comment here. Gary, you are a total badass. A true pleasure to be here today. <laughs> You've got some fans. We have, a, we have another question from Brett. 
When a business owner is using local guidelines to justify keeping the shops open, how do you convince them that going beyond local guidelines and closing cafes is the right move? Um, they've, they've had similar arguments here from yeah. people as well. Um, it, it's a big stick approach. Um, it's the state government shut them here. You know, it's basically but, the state government. But help me understand, but, have they shut them? Like coffee is not an essential item and I, I keep going backwards and forwards with people about this. Right now we have to be protecting our workforce and we have to be protecting the public. Coffee is not an essential item. Have you got I'm, I'm a, I know you do. You would have ones where you walk up and get a coffee while you're staying on the sidewalk. Right. They've, they you, they put it those? outside on a table. Uh, yeah, you, right. you rig so up. Here, yeah. here what they're doing is basically they open a window or they open a door and it's all handed over. There's no coming inside the facility. The facility is shut. But what about the queue? Isn't that exposing 1. people? 5, 1.5 metre space. Are they observing it? Uh, there are police going around arresting people if you don't. In New South Wales, it's a $10,000 fine or under arrest if you don't follow social distancing. I mean, that sounds fairly harsh, but no. that's the rule here. I mean, at the end of the day, if is a latte really that fucking worth it? I mean, in... You, you're from this part, yeah. isn't it? You know Woolworths and Coles, yeah. our supermarkets. It's like Ralph's they've, and Albertons, Albertsons yeah, or whatever. They've shut off every second cash register. Uh, Woolworths is putting up plastic screens today to protect checkout operators from customer spray. Mm. Um, and they've put X's on the floors in front of the cash registers where 1.5 metres apart and you have to stand on the X within the supermarket. That's awesome. Um, they're limiting, uh, they've just gone 20, open supermarkets here 24 seven to allow people to shop out of hours. Mm -hmm. They're in France, they've limited the amount of people who can go into a supermarket at San a time. San Diego's and done Spain, that as well. 20 people, yeah, Spain's no more got than the 20 same. people. Yep. Um, we only a certain amount. In Paris, a friend of mine lives in Paris, works for Nestle, sort of in coffee as well, and he um, is allowed 10 minutes in the supermarket per week at an allocated time. So he said what was used to be a chore is now the highlight of his week. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I've never been so grateful to go for a walk in my life. Yeah. After four, I mean, hey. I've got a balcony. I've been sitting out in the sun every single day. But just to have the freedom to get up and go for a walk, I went for a walk for three hours. Yes. It's never been so Thank lovely God. to look at trees. Thank God I got a dog because <laughs> it's certainly one of, one of the – I won't say there's an exception because they're saying you can go out and exercise in pairs. Um uh, is with their recommendation as long as you're 1.5 meters apart. But they've said you can continue to walk your dog. So, <laughs> so I, I actually before this podcast, it's quite early in the morning. I walked the dog at five in the morning this morning to keep wow. social isolation. Is so there people out? The, yeah, there were people out walking their dogs at five in the morning. Only dog walkers and people go. You know, still a you know garbage man few people on their way to and from work, but there were people out walking their dogs early. Yeah, wow. I mean, the, the social isolation thing, up the end of my street is a dog park. There, yeah. there may be 100 people with their dogs there. Dogs can't get coronavirus, by the way, but, or this Yet. variety. Um, Yet. Yeah, dogs, are, dogs can't get it. Neither can cats, for those who are worried. Um, these people now... Instead of going to the dog park, uh, the dog park's now open 24-7. So, you know, when I was walking the streets and looked in the dog park, there were people in there at five in the morning yeah, in the wow. dark. And you, <laughs> you don't normally see that. <laughs> it's, it's a new world. I, I think yeah. that on the other side of this, we're going to talk about our existence pre-coronavirus and the new age post-coronavirus. One definite change we are going to see, it's been happening slowly, this will massively accelerate it, will be 
large companies accepting working from home is a regular thing. I love that and, idea. Yeah. And an outcome, you know, uh, the person I share with works for Allianz, the big uh, insurance multinational company. insurance company. They've basically evacuated their entire office and everyone's working from home. I do work for one of the other big uh, insurance companies. They're one of my clients in Australia. No one is in their office. If this works and people are keeping up with their workload and Skyping mm -hmm. and teleconferencing and Zoom meeting, if you're a big organization, you must be considering, why am I hiring three, three floors of an office block yeah. in the CBD of a major city when this I don't need to? I think we're going to see not only a far greater acceptance of working from home, but we're going to we're going to see real estate prices probably drop in office blocks in the city. Oh, apart yeah. from other things, I think we're going to see some major social outcomes out of this. I I agree. I um I think it's going to be a new way of living. I think people are going to have new standards for what they want for their lives. A friend of mine had a um, she's been isolating her kids. I've been wanting her for a little while now about this, and and uh she isolated her kids quite early and pulled them out of school and she's been limiting their screen time quite a lot and so they spent a lot of time hanging out in the park she lives in Oregon and they've got you know big massive open spaces and one of her kids said to her why are we spending so much time together and uh and she explained it to him and he said this is lovely. I like this. She was telling him how when she was a kid, this is how she spent time with her grandmother. They went to the park and they spent time together and they played together and they were in nature. And he said, um, I think that when this is finished, we can, should continue to do this. And wouldn't that be wonderful if that's the way that the world started to pay attention and care about each other again? I see lots of positives coming from all of this. I know that this is going to sound how you would understand this. The other thing yeah. that I that is that you and I would understand for the first time ever, everyone now washes their hands properly, yes. or oh. at least has been told how to wash Sweet their hands baby properly. Baby Jesus, I just you know I work, <laughs> work in the catering industry, and you know you just you know people well, now this... are washing their hands when they leave the toilet, <laughs> and people are washing their hands when they sneeze and cough. Oh, this is why. Look, going back before this, this is why 30,000 people a year die in America of the flu. flu. It's because no one follows these rules. No one isolates. They go to work when they're sick. Yeah. They sneeze Especially on the pole in the in train. Our industry. Yeah, they sneeze on their hands and touch the supermarket trolleys. You know, this is what kills people every year, yep. that people don't look after themselves when they're sick. If you're sick with a contagious disease, you should be at home. Yep. You should self-isolate. You should wash your hands. You should sanitize after you sneeze or cough. I mean, you and I work in the food industry. We know this. I know when I did the, I did the talk yesterday for the food technologist online. Uh -huh. um, and we had, they stopped bookings at 95. Um, and I'm saying you should be doing nothing different. This, this is should, the food this industry. Is usual. <laughs> this is usual. You, yes. you know, you should change nothing. You <laughs> should, you don't come to work if you're sick. If you're sick, tell your boss and go home. Don't you know, ask wash your if you can go home. Just tell them yes. tell and them. go home. Tell them and go home. Wash your hands. If you sneeze or cough, clean up afterwards. This this is fairly standard in the food industry. The only thing while we're here, the one thing I did say that we need to consider with COVID-19, and we'll do a, a little bit about the bug itself, and you would understand this being in the background you've got, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. So it's not a food poisoning disease. So when we talk common food poisoning viruses like hepatitis and norovirus basically they're in the food you eat them they have to survive the acid in your stomach then they have to get that into your gut sorry anyone who's eating dinner then they have to be <laughs> survived not being pooed out quickly yeah yeah i hope that translates in america no, absolutely so they've, got to, <laughs> they've got to manage to lodge somewhere in there before they get out the other end then they've got to grow mm. 
So, but COVID-19 effectively is a respiratory disease and it gets down into your lungs like pneumonia. So what the with most of the food poisoning bugs, not only the norovirus and hepatitis, but things like salmonella, E. coli, listeria, the common food poisoning bugs we often deal with, it basically is going down through your gut is the problem. This gets into your lungs and it's your lungs that are your problem. So m certainly washing your hands is vitally important. Making sure surfaces are clean is vitally important. We know that it will survive. The CDC in America says it will survive on stainless steel for three days. And they also say it will survive on plastic for three days, rubber less. So we just, uh, things like keep cups It'll mm -hmm. be in the coffee industry. It'll be on the outside of a keep cup. However, if you're a barista and touch the keep cup, if you sanitize your hands afterwards, it's not a problem. It's gone. It's gone. And I've been doing research for another project. It's the the age of sustainability. So I've been doing work with one of the food donation charities over here. Oh, right. Look, looking at the risk before COVID-19, looking at the risk of food and is there a chance of food that's been through the system being donated to charity actually causing disease by bugs being on the outside of the food packaging? Right. And if you think about it, everything you buy in Walmart or Walgreens or Exxon, see, I'm very American. You are man. very, very well versed, sir. <laughs> Using your brand names over there. Everything you buy there is constantly covered in dirt. Yeah. It's constantly got everyone in those, those places buying it and horribly rats and mice and bugs crawl all over it in the warehouses and we happily put those to our mouths. Yeah. Now, there has never, ever been a published incident anywhere in the world of anyone catching a foodborne disease from the outside of food packaging. And ever? that includes... Ever, and that includes crockery, cutlery, and glassware in the food service industry. I've been unable to find a case as part of this other project I'm working on for donating food to charities. Because a lot of the food, because a lot of the food donated to charities is going to vulnerable populations. Right. It's going to old people and sick people. Okay, so the risk of getting it from the outside of a teaspoon, a sugar bowl, sachet. You know, an artificial sweetener sachet, a keep cup is incredibly low. Is there a risk? Yes. Has it ever happened before? I can find no evidence of it. Not yet. But, but, Not the yet, but does the flu risk. last as long as as this coronavirus does on the outside of a keep yes, cup? Yes, it does. Yeah, flu can. Oh, can it really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so, so can rhinovirus, the common cold, it can as well. Yeah, wow. In fact, some of those strains can last longer. Um, where your real issue is, this is a respiratory disease. Right. So two things we need to consider. Number one is obviously sneezing and coughing. Now, the CDC in America has said that if you sneeze, COVID-19, they found it in the air four hours after a sneeze. And a typical sneeze goes 10 meters. That scares the shit out of me. Now, that's where that's your issue if you're a barista right. or someone Going serving in a cafe question. is someone sneezing because it's not the – the real issue is not the sneeze on someone's hand that's touched the keep cup or the, or the spoon that you're collecting. For, not that you would have outdoor dining, but you get in some places who might yep. be listening to this, they're still outdoor dining. If you're a – what do they call those people who collect the trolleys over the there? Runners. Runners or, yeah, if you're a runner, you, you know, the risk is not from the crockery and cutlery. It's from the patron sneezing and coughing yeah. in the air is your real risk. If you're a bus, now, bus person or yeah, the, a... Yeah, the bus boys yeah. or bus persons, yeah. they've got the real risk here. It's really the, because it's a respiratory disease, it's the stuff in the air. Um, one thing I've suggested to people is, particularly if you're in an office where you share in an office, you re need to really look at whether you need fans and air conditioners. To move the air around? Period. 
Yeah, that move the air around. Wouldn't that just someone... mean it give, brings you more in contact with potentially? Correct. Correct. If you're in one end of the office and someone's 100 metres away and they're sneezing and coughing, the air conditioner will ensure it gets to you. Okay. But what about um, the similar fans? With, similar with fans. They're designed to blow air about. Yep. So I've said to a couple of people, do you, if you really don't need the air conditioners and fans on... Turn them off. You should be, you should be looking at yeah, turning yeah. them off and keeping the air still. Because there's... Uh, Anyone seen when you spray an aerosol can, like something we would call fly spray, aerosol insector, whatever they call that yeah. over there, <laughs> we call fly spray over here, When you or deodorant or any of those aerosols, when you spray it, you know that you can see a lot of the particles instantly falling down and some of the finer spray goes a bit further. Yeah. The same is true of a sneeze. Most of the bigger bits of spit yeah. uh, fall immediately down, but some of them go further than that. What you're trying to do is to limit how far those small particles go. And if you sneeze into a, into a wind that could be created by a good air conditioner, those particles are going to go further than 10 metres. Yeah, wow. so, so as much as possible, you... Because this is a respiratory disease, you want to be limiting the amount of the spread, which is why you did the right thing earlier by sneezing into your or coughing into your elbow, because it's all going to go in there. None of it's going to go anywhere else. So, it's also why tissues and handkerchiefs, if worse comes to worse and you're caught out, just go and no, at least stops it. It's far better than coughing or sneezing openly and spraying it everywhere. That's the real issue. I tell you, the person who lives above me and the person who lives next door to me, they've both developed dry coughs. And it's this, since I've been isolated, it, I've heard their coughs become gradually more and more frequent. And it reminds me of that nursery rhyme, ring a ring a rosy. Oh, yes. Yes. It's, yep. It feels very plague-like, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. Because we're all here in our apartments and we can start to hear that this is affecting the people around us. And the woman upstairs is pregnant. She's the one that's coughing. And the, the woman next door, you can hear them getting more and more sick. And you just think, wow, like this is going to infect everybody. Well, lots yes. of people, and you're going to encounter more and more severe cases of this. It's going to be, and I, for everyone that's in the live chat, I know that there's a very important question in there, and we're going to get to it um, in a second. But what I do want to ask you about at this point, because it's quite poignant, is the idea of mutation. And yes. so as we watch what's going on with Italy and the incidents the, co the difference in the rate of incidence in different age cohorts. And people in the beginning were just saying that this is something that's hitting the immunocompromised and the elderly. And we're seeing in Italy and in France that the age of the, or the incidences in younger populations are starting to increase. Now, do you think that this could be something and I want to talk here as well about this idea of virus consciousness. It's the only word I could think of to come up with for it. But the point, a virus is trying to infect as many hosts as possible. That's its job. And it, yes. it mutates accordingly to maximize its chance of doing that. Do you think that it's plausible that the consciousness of this virus, or if there's a better way to say that, tell me what it, it help me learn what that is. But could is it possible that the virus has figured out that w we need to infect younger people and ex and get them sick? I I don't think that's what's happened. What has um, happened then? Do you think? Well, I su I suppose what we let me um. Let me go back and do a little bit and try and do the, you know, the the Sesame Street version of Please virology do. and how a virus works. Um, 
viruses technically are not alive right. um, under the definition of life because viruses don't have DNA. Mm -hmm. So what viruses do is a virus gets into the cell of an animal or it can be in a plant or a bacteria. A virus basically attacks another thing. It gets into the cell nucleus and then it takes over that cell and tells the DNA in that cell, stop what you're doing and you are now going to make viruses. And it, it basically hijacks the cell to make viruses. Sweet now, baby Jesus. It turns right. you into a virus-making factory? Yes, it turns you into a virus-making factory. That's how viruses work. They take over your body like like as everything you've seen in science fiction, mm -hmm. they take over and the cells of your body become virus-making machines and they stop doing what they're meant to do and just make viruses. Yeah, okay. Now, there are, two <laughs> as there, are, there are two aspects of that we need to consider. DNA, it's probably the best analogy, is like a computer program mm -hmm. for those who have written a computer program. And so DNA is step, 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 step. And in a normal cell, it traces along the DNA and basically says, do this, do this, do this. And eventually, you know, that's a heart, that's a lung, that's blue eyes, that's you'll live to 80, that's you're going to be a boy. Right. And it translates along. Now, what happens when a virus takes over? There are two possibilities. One of them is the virus has something called RNA, which is not quite DNA, mm -hmm. and that's the virus's own version of DNA. So like if you're constantly doing something over and over, you occasionally make a mistake, that can happen. So the virus constantly making new viruses means occasionally it makes a mistake. Now, if that thing survives... And the thing that has the mistake in it, like a, like a virus in a computer code, good analogy here. So if you get a computer code that's corrupted, that's similar to the viral DNA. Now, if that, that bug with the corrupted DNA or RNA in it is actually a mutant strain. Right. And so some of you in America would know um, E. coli 0157. Yep. Uh, that that is a mutant strain. You've got a real and Salmonella enteritis. You've got that over there as well. Those are extra extra dangerous strains. Now that's a second thing that viruses can do. So the first thing is when they write their own code, they can be corrupted, and we can get a mutant strain that's more dangerous. Most mutant strains die. You know, yep. so instead of to use the human analogy, it says make two lungs, don't make a heart. And that thing will die, if that right. makes sense. Yep. But, you know, vi viruses are less sophisticated. You know, yeah, less sophisticated. So more will survive. And we could get a really dangerous strain that suddenly, instead of makes you sick, makes you die, could okay. appear. And roughly once every 100,000 cases, you get a mutant strain that becomes a new strain like there's two strains of hiv and they believe there's now two strains of COVID 19 one of those viruses turning in replicating itself has corrupted and the strain has survived and become a new strain so the new strain that they're they're talking about what is this what this theory that i've heard that there's a strain that's killing people quicker than others yeah, this new strain That's is a bit sturdier. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, th this one somehow, when it's read the DNA, has somehow adopt found something that makes it uh, kill quicker and kill younger. Now, right. So it is like a, a. It is a, in our last conversation, we talked. Oh, look. Let's use the Terminator analogy. Okay. Remember, Arnie, <laughs> remember Arnie in the first version? Yes. And in the second one, there was a more sophisticated yes. Terminator. The artificial intelligence had worked out. They basically, the virus accidentally has discovered a more potent Terminator. Somehow, in when it's 
when it's transcribed the DNA to make more viruses, one ha a mutant strain is developed that is more dangerous. And so it's like evolution on speed. Yes, yes. So instead of millions of years of evolution, it's growing so rapidly right. that evolution's happening as we see it. Now, there's a second possibility of how you get a mutant strain. Okay. Is... Let's pick you. It's in Lee's cells. It is. And, yeah. And so when it's using your DNA, it might not just use its DNA. It might accidentally cut and paste some of your DNA into it. And so suddenly a virus occurs that is mainly virus, partly Lee in there. And so, say, for example, a human has the ability to live to 80. Suddenly, we've got a virus that can live to 80, that sort of thing. Or wow. it's a fish, that can, a fish that can breed underwater, or it's a bacteria that survives freezing for 10 years. So if this virus takes part of the DNA, it can take an attribute of the organism, the host. The host. So in... Some of these COVID-19 cases, it's not just COVID-19, the viruses that are growing are snipping out and it's random because different viruses in different cells will be snipping out different bits of DNA. That's one of the things that they think is the issue with E. coli 0157 that you had over there. Yep. E. coli somehow found a bit more dangerous DNA it was Shigella, from another wasn't it? organism. Yeah, Shigella, the dysentery bug. Somehow a Shigella and an E. coli mated and, had a and the resulting organism everybody. pulled the bit out of Shigella that causes <laughs> dysentery. So viruses have two... God, for someone who's a food tech working in catering, I'm not too bad on virology. So <laughs> doing the, great. The, 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 the two ways... I, I, was, I wasn't a virologist to a month ago. So there was... There's basically two ways a new mutant strain of a virus. One of them is it makes a mistake when it's transcribing and it makes a mistake in copying and that new badly copied DNA, uh, RNA may become a new mutant strain. But the second thing is because it's using your DNA to make a new virus, it might accidentally cut and paste some of your DNA in and we don't know what that will do because there are some – you've got some advantages over a virus and some of those might make it a super virus. Now, does it – I mean – For example, you've got resistance to some diseases. As a human, you're resistant to some diseases. If a virus comes in, it can take that and suddenly that virus becomes resistant. Which leads me to my next question. This idea of having a vaccine or using medicine that is already antiviral medicine that's already available, um, that's a little concerning if we're not going to do the proper trials that are going to require us the, to deem it yes. efficacy. Uh, I suppose what they're doing here, and what, there's a number of those in Australia. There's a um, a lupus one. There's a malaria one. Mm. There's a HIV one. Um, I know are being trialled here. There's at least one other. What they're using at the moment is drugs with a history of being safe or relatively safe, where you don't get symptoms other symptoms apart from known symptoms. Anyway, I know people have been on the HIV medication. You certainly get symptoms on that one. Yeah. So if what they're trialing here are the drugs we already know effectively won't kill you, won't give you cancer, won't cause birth defects. They're using the the common drugs. Um, the For example, the one here that they treat lupus is has been used in humans for 70 years. The malaria drug is 30. The HIV drug's been around for 20 years. They're trialing antivirals and they're saying, look, we've got all these drugs that, that cure viruses. Exist. 
let's try the ones we already got because we've got big stocks of them. We know they don't kill anyone or have major effects. Let's trial these. And if one of these works, we've already got a drug that works. Right. Because to go through the typical clinical trials, you're supposed to have 20 years of clinical trials. So whenever you launch a new drug, particularly in the US with the FDA, FDA it is the FDA, yep. Um, the FDA, you're supposed to present 20 years of clinical trials to show that 20 years later you don't die of liver cancer or your bones don't rot right. or, it, you know, your children don't grow you know, grow up a foot shorter than they should. So <laughs> they're trying to, the drugs they're trialling at the moment have gone through the FDA trials already or the equivalent in the country they're based in. So the drugs they're trialling are at least 20 years old where they've all been approved, they have a history of use, they don't have huge side effects, and they're really hoping, let's hope a drug that's already there, that we already have a stockpile of, that we're already set up to manufacture, works, and we can instantly throw that at the at the problem. Roger. So they're looking at those cures and treatments. So some of the drugs they're trialling treat an existing viral condition. Yeah. Um, and some of, and I suppose HIV is the good analogy here. There are some drugs with HIV which treat you after you test HIV positive. Okay. And there are drugs on the market that you take if you want to have unprotected sex, for example, and they're antivirals or will actually stop the virus in the first place. From infecting but, you. From infecting. So actually, they're trialing, that's not true from from proliferating from, you. It won't from stop it from infecting you. So right. they're trialling both preventative and corrective drugs, antivirals at the moment, to try and find something. They're trying to find a one as a protective to give to the population, a bit like vaccination. Right. But they're also trying to find one for all those thousands of people who are going to turn up into hospitals In to try and alleviate the symptoms as well. So... So help me understand something. My understanding is that the reason that the flu vaccine is only um, a certain percent effective is because of the mutation rate. And Correct. the flu vaccine that they're administering this year is based on the flu that showed up last year. Yes. Or in previous years. And yes. so if they try and come up with, and this is directly related to the question that Roger's asking in the in the group. So if they come up with a vaccine right now, but the virus continues to mutate, we then have to keep coming up with a vaccine that keeps up with the mutation rate of the virus. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Um, one of the other reasons flu is a problem is it's not only last year's flu. And there's the probably ones. yeah, there's probably five flus, mm. uh, particularly in a country like America and Australia, where everyone. You know, America is where everyone goes to. I think Australia has the highest rate of passport ownership in the yeah. world. Yep, We've got, yeah, We travel overseas quite regularly. Countries like Australia and America, where everyone flies in and out, a typical flu season will have five major flus. One mm. will dominate, but there'll be typically four or five different flu strains in most of the countries where lots of people travel. So even if you do get immunized against one flu you could still catch one of the other ones particularly if you travel overseas or are in contact with people who've brought it to where you are right and so even when we come up with a vaccine we're coming up with a vaccine for one strain or the we yeah you, we can be lucky um for example some of the antivirals for hiv do both strains. And luckily with AIDS, there's still only two strains right. or two right. known strains. We can be lucky and we'll get one that affects most strains. Like measles, there are multiple strains of measles and it tends to be one vaccination does a lot. Whooping okay. cough. But cholera. even with measles, the vaccine hasn't been as effective in recent years as it was in years before that. And that yeah, is Yeah, because there the are reason. more strains appearing right. that are more resistant. And, and that's and we, what we need yep, to be worried about, right, yep, is the resistance to the vaccine that the virus will start to develop through mutation, possibly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either because accidentally it's going to get it or it'll steal the DNA from someone right. who is resistant, resistant to it and it'll pull that resistance out of its host. Right. So 
Uh, we just had a question related to this. So that means that COVID-19 is here to stay then? Is that so? Yes. Yes. It's yep. here permanently. Like every foo strain and every yep. cold strain is still here. Like every salmonella is still here. There, and look, I suppose that's an oversimplification. Look, some of them will die out. Right. Um, but we have to learn how to live with this or keep up with the vaccines with regards yep. to it and build up a natural immunity. Yeah, I suppose smallpox is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, smallpox, bar, I believe, a lab in America and a lab in Russia, is pretty much wiped out. That That is almost, in fact, I believe if that disappears, that will be the first, li the first organism on Earth right. that man has successfully made extinct. Right. Right. Um, I mean, we've made a lot of them accidentally extinct. Mm -hmm. Smallpox, to my knowledge, is the only organism we have successfully made Eradicated. extinct. Eradicated. Yeah, right. we've never made a flu strain extinct. We've never made a cold strain extinct. They're all there somewhere. Unless it's hiding up in the Siberian tundra and the ice melts and it comes back into well, the they, population. Well, they, as you know, they're quite concerned that they yes. buried huge amounts of bodies in the permafrost up there and they're starting yep. to thaw. And so the Spanish flu strains are in a lot of those bodies. None of us have any, unless you're 90, none of us have any immunity to the right. Spanish flu. And that's another possibility we've got occurring in the next year or two. So, that, that, Which sounds, a, it's, a, it's a great year when you've got that to look forward to. Oh, look, I don't think any of us came into 2020 thinking that any of this was going to evolve and have just started begging for 2019, which was a fucking horrible year for so many people, to come back. <laughs> I mean, the, well, I, the new I consciousness. Say that, Go ahead. I would say down here, 2019 was pretty awful. Yeah. Uh, we're in catastrophic drought. Um, I got evacuated twice from my house because of bushfire. Wow. Um, we had... We had multiple cyclones. We had floods. 2019 was possibly, was the worst year ever for weather in Australia. And then and 2020 says, hold worse. my beer. <laughs> yeah, 2020 is even worse. I mean, I wouldn't have thought, I, I got evacuated twice from a bushfire because my house almost burned down. Wow. I thought, well, the next year has to be better. It can't get and worse, not, right? And it's not. It's got yeah. worse. 2020 is like, fuck you, every, every other year, let me show you exactly what I can do to make these humans start to care about each other and start yes. to pay attention. There's a really interesting question that Brett asked. Where is it? Um all right. Are we going to potentially see mass wasted agricultural harvests this fall if mi migratory workers are unable to travel across international borders? I feel like that's a given. Uh, yes. Um, that's already being considered in Australia. Um, a lot of the migratory workforce, I'm assuming in it'd be Latin America and South America, most of your migratory workforce would come from in America. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. In yeah. ours, it's the Pacific Islands. So places like Samoa, Tuvalu, um, the Solomon Islands, a lot of people come over. They're being banned from coming out of their country. Yeah. Uh, one thing that they're doing here, we've got a huge amount of backpackers over here on tourist visas. They were all on um, fucking Bondi Beach the other day. Oh, yeah, uh, which is why beaches have been shut. In, I can't believe in... that. Like, that's the thing that makes you look at it and say, where's the leadership that's stepping in before that happens and says you can't do that? But I guess they just assumed people would take it seriously. Yes, they did, which is why now it's a $10,000 fine yeah. if you're caught assembling. I mean, to the extent, and this will shock, we now are no longer allowed to have more than five people in a gathering in your home. What about unless family? It's your family? Oh, okay. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, with family. Family, yes. But you can't have more than, so it's something like a barbecue. Yeah. Um, they're limited to five at a wedding in our country. <laughs> so you can have the, the celebrant, the bridegroom, and the two witnesses. Um, ten at a, fun, ten at a funeral. Wow. I mean, so you can see 
you know, things like events, convention centres, but this in the last couple of days, it's that, that's all been stopped. So things like florists are now going broke, you know. Yeah. You know, all of those kindred industries, people who do greeting cards, you know, all of that is just oh. stopping. They're looking at stopping the post offices here because too many people are assembling in post offices because they don't, you know, people who don't have the internet, there's still quite a few people. Yeah. So the, New Zealand, of course, has stopped all of that. Yeah, well, a friend of mine has a flower farm in rural New South Wales and he's got all his flowers are starting to bloom for Mother's Day. And, of course, he won't be able to pick any of them. Yes. With this itinerary, what they're doing in Australia with the backpackers is they're going to do automatic extension of their visas provided they they're going to give them six months extension provided two months is spent going to rural areas to pick agricultural crops. Yeah. Um, the other thing, we've just had some fa um, some fairly devastating redundancies. Uh, Qantas, the airline, just retrenched 20,000 people. Um, Virgin just retrenched 8,000 last night. The big clothing chains, which you would know here, Rivers, Katie's, have just shut down and wow. retrenched 20,000 people. Um, those people... Uh, now, uh, Domino's is hiring 5,000 because of home yeah. delivery, um, where they're being offered jobs in rural areas to pick agricultural crops. So we're seeing, um, and the supermarkets are hiring drivers for home delivery. So we're seeing some industries who can't keep up, but a lot of the, the people who are being made redundant are being offered, uh, they're being offered these rural jobs, whether they take them or not. It's a... Uh... An interesting one, particularly for the coffee industry, because we're starting to hear of cases of uh, COVID-19 infecting or becoming prevalent in coffee producing countries and mm. amongst the coffee picking communities. And so not only uh, going to Brett's question, are we going to see a lot of agricultural product stay on trees and not get picked. You know, here in California, we have an extraordinary agricultural community. And the last last year in 2019, we had a problem because when Trump shut down the borders uh, and started scaring people about ICE going in and arresting them for being undocumented, they stopped showing up for work. So all the orchards... All the avocado plantations, all of them, none of them were getting picked. Very minimum amount were getting picked. And so on the other side of the border, on Mexico, they took the opportunity to strike. And so we were having like an agricultural war happening here. Now what we're going to start to see, not only are we going to have not enough of a workforce, we're going to start to see the fact that the economics has stopped. So because coffee here is slowing down and people, I mean, our industry was wiped out on the 15th of March over here. And many of those businesses will never open again. Four years in a row, our supply has outstripped our demand, which has led to a coffee price crisis on the futures commodity trading market. And Roger's just asked a question based on Brett's question. Are we going to see then the C price, which is that co the futures mm -hmm. coffee market that I was talking about? Uh, are we going to see then the C price down due to massive overproduction of coffee? Something similar to when Brazil overproduced coffee back in the 20s. And the answer is we can never know for sure, but that's what I would be hedging my bets on is that we were already for this year was going to be the fifth year. We're already into the fifth year of demand, uh, sorry, supply outstripping demand by a long shot. And now what we're going to, to witness is they've had bumper crops this year. I don't know if that's an Australian term. They've had really, really great crops in yeah, we know what bumper crop is. We use bumper crop here. Yeah, it's an Australian term, but I don't know if the Americans understand it. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yes. 
so I know for a fact that Brazil has had great producing weather this uh, season and they're at the end of their harvest. And so a lot of their containers have already shipped and they have had an overproduction. And the if you were playing the sea market right now, you would expect that it's going to go down even further than the low that it had last year, which was 87. And, and for those who don't understand, the very basics of that is if we assume that it costs somewhere around $2, $2.50 to produce a fairly reasonable commercial grade coffee per pound at 87 cents, that's so far below the cost of production. That doesn't even include the cost of doing business, which means the cost of loans at 50%. Uh, the farmers who create this complex agricultural product that we have are getting loans between 30 and 50 percent so the burden that they have on them right now was horrible before this and we were moving in a direction where what we were trying to do was get commercial grade coffee farmers to start considering moving towards specialty coffee production this is pretty much really gonna hurt the back end of our supply chain no matter how you look at it if they manage to survive the the virus itself it's going to take years for this to get back on track for our supply chain i think lee you've got a double whammy not only you've got a massive oversupply you're up go starting the very start of people not you, the, the demands dropping substantially right. quickly yeah, too. Yeah. Quickly, quickly 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 i mean look in new zealand you can't go buy a cup of coffee now for a month yeah as, as a small country australia has shut over 80 percent of its cafes and restaurants you know you're going new york where well, you can get a coffee takeaway you're not going to be sitting down in a restaurant and thinking oh that was a nice dinner. Now I will have a cup of coffee. Right. There's there's going to be a substantial drop in demand for coffee around the world uh, with a whole lot of other products as well. But the, the interesting part about it is, and I, I keep trying to help manage people's expectations, not just for what's happening in this moment, but what's coming. Now, the darkest part of this is yet to show up. And we're going to react to the darkest part of this in different ways. So pretty soon, somewhere around 6 to 15 days from now, we're going to see a fairly steep rise in the mortality rate. And people are just simply going to, out of shock of that, it is going to be the jolt that people wake up to and it will stop people going to takeaway shops it will stop food getting delivered people will just shut down in my opinion that's what I see happening people will start to realize the severity and start realizing oh fuck this is what this disease does my friend in Paris um someone in his apartment block has died from COVID-19 and he he you know, he so works in the food right. industry. He un he understood that. Right. But he said, you know, when the ambulance comes and because it's one of those typical Parisian apartments with the mm. central courtyard, everyone's leaning out the window watching their neighbour being taken out in a body bag uh, because it's an infectious disease. Uh, and the people are going, the ambulance men are in hazmat suits. And he said, if you weren't shocked by this already, surely that sort of thing is bringing it home. The scenes in Italy where the where the army is taking away the coffins because there aren't enough undertakers to deal with all the bodies. Yeah. You know, that sort of stuff is making the news over here. And, and that's the, I feel, and unfortunately by this point it's going to be too late, but I feel like that is the shocking point that's going to get people to take this seriously. It's going to be around Easter time for you. Yeah. Which which I'm saying that deliberately because that's when Donald Trump wants everyone to go to church. Yeah. Well, did you hear what was happening in Greece with the Orthodox Church? No. 
the Greek Orthodox Church in the lead up during Lent and all of that, um, and for anyone who's going to ask, I don't have any problem with any churches or whatever. I'm not religious. My ex-husband was Greek Orthodox. Lots of love to all of you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the Greek Orthodox Church said, "Don't worry about what the government's saying. Come to church. Your faith will protect you." And the government overruled them and outlawed any church gatherings. And it's this kind of behavior, like hashtag science. You know, like this virus isn't going to skip you because you're going to church and that there's some incense there. You know, it, it just doesn't work like that. And I don't think that people will understand the magnitude of the seriousness of this until they start seeing this spike go up and realize like, oh, my faith is not going to protect me. Lee, has the US banned church gatherings? Uh, mostly. So there's yeah, there's no ga- gatherings. I know in California and New York and Washington, there's no gatherings of more than 10 people. In can Australia? Some, can church, someone correct in me a, in, the, in the comments if I've got that wrong, please? Go ahead. In Australia, Australia churches are banned. Churches are just stopped. Yep. Um, we've seen, except we had a, we had a drive-in church where a, uh, a, dry, a minister hired what I would call a tort liner, the truck with the collapsible sides on them. You see them oh, in the yeah. coffee industry quite regularly. Yeah, yeah. The, the minister went to the end of a field with a broadcasting system and everyone drove in and he did the church service from, the, from a, a, a truck and people drove in in their cars and he did the church service wow. with everyone sitting in their cars. Yeah, someone needs to talk to him about Zoom. Yes. Well, he's a church person. So, but yes. So that worked. I've seen that. That made the news here. The, yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, I've been talking about this since the end of January. I've been trying to scream at the coffee industry to take notice of it. At the time, everyone was like, stop it. You're making a big deal out of nothing. It's n- all of it. Right. I'm uniquely positioned. This is what I studied. Plus, I can see what's going on with our industry. Unfortunately, I, you, I think the cupping process will change after all of this. I think if you're not fucking terrified to cup after this, I don't know what more people can do mm. to convince you that this is a problem. I mean, the, ho- the way the whole world operates... I, do you watch movies now and freak out if you see someone shaking hands? <laughs> the the one I, I noticed Prince Charles has detected COVID nineteen positive today, yeah. and I noticed he was the one doing the namaste, yes. um, which which is being done. We, we've got a significant Asian population in Sydney. There are people who do that these days now rather than shake hands. Oh, and it's just it's necessary. I think a lot is going to change moving forward. Um, I just at this point want to remind anyone in the chat, there's been loads of comments. Thank you for everything that you guys have been saying. It's been wonderful. Can start pouring out all the questions that you have so that we can start running them off one by one. Uh, If there's anything that I haven't picked out because there's been a lot of chat going on, please just start putting them in here so that we can um, make sure that Gary gets to whatever your questions are. I have a a strange question left of field with Mm. regards to this. Is it possible for a virus to go from being in humans to infecting a plant? Oh, uh, I'm not aware of that ever happening. It can certainly go from animal to animal. I mean, we think that this has come out of a bat potentially, or out of a snake. There are lots of, look, in terms of science fiction movies, like, you know, Je- uh, Jeff Bridges in Starman, and, yeah. you know, scientifically, is it possible? Yeah, I suppose it's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. And in fact, when you move from species to species, it has to be similar, because when the virus is reading, if you like, it 
can own it's like you trying to read something in Arabic. You can't read it because oh, you're actually, not set that, I can read you, Arabic. Oh, Let's pick a different example there. <laughs> pick a different What's example. Uh, Let's Sanskrit. pretend I couldn't Sanskrit, Sanskrit. I cannot read. <laughs> I, do, I don't believe in your hieroglyphics. You know, it, it's if that makes a good analogy, a virus is set up to read certain things and if it comes across something and it just can't read it, it can't transcribe it because right. it's not set up to read it. It's like, I suppose a, a better analogy is Apple and Microsoft. You know, you can't yep. take an Apple device and You're instantly doing great with these analogies, Microsoft. dude. Yeah, or Microsoft, I don't do this for a living, sort of. <laughs> or my, Microsoft work doesn't necessarily work on Apple. So it's yeah. the same thing with a virus. Okay. Just because you've got a virus, it doesn't automatically go across. But it can, you know, mad cow disease um, right. is, originally, is originally a disease of sheep. Scrapey, um, the um, the Hendra virus in Australia, um, which is um, a relative of Ebola, um, came out of bats. First affected horses, but also we know kills humans and dogs. Uh, we know that HIV/AIDS is thought to come out of chimpanzees. So yeah, wow. certainly there are diseases that originally started in another animal and have ended up in humans. But going from animal to plant, we've never observed that, right? right? I think it's I think it's real scientifically, yes, but I don't. Oh, it would be very, very, very unlikely it could possibly happen. Right. So I don't think a human with COVID could give it to a coffee plant, if that's what you're alluding well, to. Well, I'm just thinking about like because yes, it, I'm thinking about stuff like that. Like if people are forced to go into to work and and things like that. We know that if through the way that coffee is processed, that it wouldn't last long enough through the roasting oh, process and all of that. Let's go the other way okay. um, and talk about some talk about plant viral diseases, thinking like tobacco mosaic virus okay. or potato leaf virus. They're both common plant viral diseases. Right. Never. Net, and they've been around for hundreds of years. Potatoes and tobacco in America are both big crops. Yeah, We've never seen any transmission to any other species that's non-plant. Right. So if it doesn't go from plant to animal, it's extremely unlikely to go from animal to plant. Right. Okay. Great. I'm, I, I knew that question was left to field, but... I'm a songwriter, which makes me a, like a very creative person. So I like grabbed that thought and went, "Ooh, that would be interesting. It'd be a great movie." <laughs> it would look, I'm, look. I've looked at. I'm old enough to remember the Amiga Man, the Andromeda Strain, <laughs> and Contagion, all of which apparently are huge at the moment on Netflix. Yes, and yes other they are. Don't stations. watch them. Don't fucking do it to yourself. It's not the time to no, freak yourself no, out. No, no, no. No, you don't want to be watching things like that. Um, the hot zone, none of it. Don't do it. Yeah, none of those sort of films. <laughs> um, but uh, those films, to some extent, are, uh, are are the extreme version. But if you're right, some of this stuff could be turned into a science fiction yeah. film. Well, but it there is. is. What's happening right now is it, it's following Contagion. It is out of science fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> is, what, <laughs> this, this is a movie. This is the movie Contagion. <laughs> this yes. is Contagion. <laughs> This is contagion. This is what happens. Yes. But have you heard about uh, that? Let's hope, look. Look. Touch. This is not. I can't think what the Will Smith version of it was. The old Charlton Heston Amiga Man from the seventies. Uh -huh. Which basically there was him who was the only person who had trailed the new vaccine, and the mutants who had survived the disease were the only ones left on Earth. Well, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Touch wood, but we just don't know what the next two months are going to look like. You never know what's going to evolve and how it's going to mutate. Well, apart from flattening the curve, the other reason, I suppose a couple of other reasons why they're trying to slow the rate down. One, gives you a chance to test all these other drugs. Right. Gives you a chance to get any, and run all these other antiviral drugs and hopefully find one that either cures or assist in alleviating symptoms. Shout out to all yep. the volunteers that are offering their body as up for these trials. Yep. <laughs> um, and you're, a lot of them over here are medical staff, partly because you want to protect them, partly because yeah. they're good at reporting symptoms and effects because that's what they do. Yeah. Um, 
your your other aspect you want to do, if you can slow the rate down, there are simply less people with it and you're less likely to get a mutant strain developing. Right. So not only is it freeing up beds for people who are genuinely ill, it is allowing you time to trial the antivirals who are currently sitting on the market to see if any of those work. And it's there are less cases, so we've got less likelihood of a, of a dangerous mutant strain happening. Yeah, wow. Roger's asking, are there any long-lasting effects after being cured of COVID-19? If so, which ones? We don't know yet. We The theory is, unlike hepatitis, which stuffs your liver permanently, um, this appears, because it's respiratory, appears to have the same problems as um, pneumonia and extremely bad flu. So, yes, permanent lung damage can happen. If you get this really badly, you can end up with permanent lung damage. So poor breathing, emphysema type symptoms. They definitely know that happens. Yeah. And so people with, Go ahead. So people who have recovered from this have permanent lung damage, can have permanent lung damage. But most people who get over this get over it like flu or cold. They never have any symptoms going forward. But they do know in some of the really bad cases there is significant lung damage that's permanent. And we don't know as it mutates what the other kinds of long-lasting symptoms yes. are going to... Or... Yeah, when it mutates, who knows? And look, not to scare anyone, who knows? We, it mutates and it causes stroke or it mutates yeah, and causes know. cancer. We, we It mutates and causes your tongue to go blue. We have no idea what happens when these things mutate because we have no idea what genetic defects going to happen and we have no idea what bit of DNA it may steal from you. So going forward, we don't know what these things are. The big advantage is nearly every mutant strain dies. Right. Because most of them are just, it's like trying, the old analogy, we like trying to play a record with a crack in it. It's permanently cracked. Yeah. You can't remove the crack. So it's like a faulty computer code with a virus in. That computer code just doesn't work anymore. Most mutant viruses die because the mutant strain can't survive. It's not suited for the environment it's in. What we're going to worry is the one mutant strain in 100,000 that in fact is better than the original virus. And more virulent and can And more adapt. virulent or, or lasts longer or survives alcohol better or needs to be cooked to a higher temperature or lives 10 days on plastic or some other adapted strain that makes it harder to kill. I'll tell you the part that I don't understand. So Roger was saying earlier in the chat that he and his wife have been wiping down all the packaging that comes into their house now from delivering. So if your studies have shown that nothing that there's never been an incidence of this happening. If if it lasts on packaging for that long. Three days. Three days. What, why wouldn't it infect people? Why isn't the incidence more likely to be increased by this? Again, apologies and dinner. Basically, it has to get into the respiratory tract, which means it has to get basically, you either breathe it in, it goes via air directly into your lungs, yep. or it's going to go in via your mouth, nose, your eyes. But your, or, oh, right. your stomach's going to, your stomach acid's going to take care of killing Yeah, it. if it goes down that way, your stomach acid, so it really has to get right. into your lungs. So you're really so looking for the in. fluids from your face getting into your lungs. So to use Rod, Roger, basically has to lick the packet after it's been sneezed, or touch. If they make, oh right. So if he touch touches it, it and then licks his hand, it, he then still puts it in his mouth. Right. So if he touches all of that, because if he touches it and then washes his hands, he's fine. Then then he's fine. And for Roger and the other people listening. Those packages regularly have flu, colds, hepatitis, yeah. E. coli, salmonella, listeria are regularly on all the packages so do your apples, you buy people. In, in Walgreens and Exxon <laughs> and Walmart and, and Target and all the other places. And not just the food packaging, it's on the pajamas and the ream of paper and the petrol fuel pump and the and the bus pole, it, the, the shopping trolley handle, the carry basket, it's on all of those. 
And it's always there. We would be dying regularly. Wash your hands. We should Just talk a little bit about it. We should talk a little bit about washing your hands, why it works. Yeah, please do because I'm one of these people who goes fucking nutso at baristas who stick their hands in cups as they're picking them up off the top of the coffee machine. And when I try to help them understand, like, do you understand what you're doing? You've just like wiped your forehead or your nose or whatever, sneezed into your hand and then you're picking up a cup. Are you understanding the seriousness? Or scratch lower lower down. Exactly. All of that. Yeah. Um, talk about why washing your hands is super important. All right. So there are basically two methods that everyone is saying you should do to wash your hands at the moment. One of them is to use an alcohol-based sanitizing gel. Good luck on getting one. Um, your other one is to use soap and warm water. Oh, yeah, yeah, not there. You've got one too, right? Right yeah. by you. Look, I, yeah, look, I'm, and can I say of the two... Soap and warm water work better. Right. Than alcohol gels. Awesome. Okay. So, and we're he- let's go through, uh, they both work in a similar fashion from a microbiological viewpoint. Mm-hmm. So, let's start with a virus like all, like all cells has an outer membrane on it. Uh-huh. And... Most things, if you think steak, celery, coffee, are basically composed of protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So in a coffee bean, you don't have much fat. It's mainly protein and carbohydrate. But in um, in a, a, a steak, there's definitely cells that are mainly fat. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if we think that a virus or a bacteria or a mold has an outer membrane where it's made of protein, fats, and carbohydrates, what alcohol does is it dissolves the fat. So it actually gets there and it pulls the fat out. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is the viral wall, because it's not technically a cell wall, the membrane around the virus becomes weak and it breaks open. What we would call lysis breaks open and and it can't die because it's not alive, but it it's it no spews longer a, its internals into your bloodstream. Yes. Yeah, basically, <laughs> for want of a better term for today's podcast, it dies. It dies. <laughs> so, so basically the alcohol dissolves the fat in it. The, the membrane wall becomes weaker. It breaks open and dies. Mm-hmm. Now, similar is true with soap and warm water, but soap is even better. Soap has two effects. Number one is your body constantly produces oil Mm -hmm. so you constantly have a greasy layer all over the skin of your body and you know we all know particularly on things like the face where we would wipe some of the grease off yeah we so your hands have a greasy layer one of the reasons there is bacteria and viruses on your hands is they are sticking to the grease on your hands so soap is a surfactant. Soap dissolves grease. So washing your hands properly, just the first thing for viruses is it dissolves the grease and it literally washes most of them away. So the first effect of soap is most of the germs, and we'll put that the generically, (laughs) germs on your skin are washed away by the soap. The second thing is soap has the same effect as alcohol. So soap also dissolves fats. Mm -hmm. So if there are any COVID-19s or listerias or hepatitises or salmonellas on your your hands afterwards, the soap will also take the fat out of the membrane and they will also break open and die. So soap and water are actually better than alcohol because they have two benefits. The first thing is they dissolve this grease on your skin and most things wash away. Then what's left over, the remaining soap kills that are, that are on your hands. Thank you, because... <laughs> popping into his hand. Bad mistake. Look, I'll use a sanitizing gel. I don't have my... I'm sitting doing a podcast. I don't have my... Your soap. <laughs> yeah. I don't have my soap and water with oh, me. Oh, your hanky. <laughs> yes. For anyone who doesn't know. tissues, yes. <laughs> you know, I have noticed that... Um, 
Lee, I'm getting a low battery warning, okay. so we'll see how we go. We should start thinking about wrapping this up then because the last thing I want to do is uh, is have we, you just... We dis- can do it. Lee, I'm happy to... If you have questions that keep coming sent in afterwards, let me know and we can do another one of these. No problem. I just want to say how grateful I am and how much you have been able to bring confidence to people who have listened to the last podcast and in this because everybody the the comments that are coming through um you know people saying I'm being enlightened today thank you Gary calling you a badass all that kind of stuff it is in moments like this that we see leaders who are well informed step up to the call of duty that they have been invited to occupy and you i know that you're not a virologist but to people like us in the coffee industry you understand our natural concerns because we are your industry as well you take care of us with regards to food safety and you have the background of actually what's going on and we can trust you um so thanks for doing this for us we really appreciate it no worries it's a it's really important and and it's it's just wonderful I hope everyone who meets you shouts you a fucking coffee as soon as this, as soon as they're allowed to. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's going to be a long time before I get to the US to take you up on that free cup of coffee. <laughs> um, I, uh, before we go, I do have a question for you. One last question. I know that you don't know the answer to this, but it's let's play a game. How long do you think it's going to take before it's over? Ah. Uh... I'm. We're telling people here: be prepared for six months. Yeah. Um, I look. The one thing that will change, and it's probably going to change. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be quicker change for your country, where we're doing more over here than you appear to be doing over there. I mean, New York and LA doing a lot. The the feedback we're hearing here is the rest of the country is not doing much. And I don't know whether that's... Slowly anyway. They're reacting very slowly. And that's what's terrifying for people like us who... We've studied how this has gone through in other plagues and in other... I mean, we understand the severity of what's going on. People are just too slow to the uptake. The thing that will have to change, if it's six months for that slow curve to go through, Mm -hmm. the thing that will have to change in two to three months, probably possibly sooner in some places in America, is... It won't be someone like Kellogg's can't say, well, I'm shutting down my factory today because someone tested positive or Coca-Cola won't be able to do that because half their staff are going to have this. Or it's have going it and to, don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's going to get to the stage where you can't shut your place down because one person has tested yeah. positive because so many people are going to test positive. And that's going to be the next way of how the hell do we think about this, where we these essential industries that you've got, how do you keep those going when half the hospital staff have COVID-19? How do you keep veterinary services or the armed forces going if half a military base comes down with COVID-19 and we have to isolate? The, yeah, wow. That Those are the next series of decisions when it gets to the stage where we can't just isolate and shut down, where we have to admit it's too big a problem and we just kind of have to deal with it. Yeah. They're, they're saying that the WHO, I watch the press briefing every day, and the other day uh, someone asked them about this idea of why don't we just let everybody get it and build up a herd immunity? And their response was that only works once 50% of the global population has been infected. Yes. And 50% of the global population being infected is fucking terrifying. Yeah, that's tens of millions of people will die given current infection and death rates. Yeah, wow. Anyway, I want to be uh, respectful of your battery life. And I I apologise. No, no, for please this. don't. Please don't apologise. We're just so grateful That's that you. That's because I got up at six in the morning to come in for this <laughs> and ran best. out of my, and left the stupid cord at home. It's, it's totally okay. We're really grateful for your time. So look, I apologise to everyone who thought this podcast might be longer. Please keep sending Lee questions. Email them if to me. Been, 
Yeah. If it's super, super urgent, we're in contact. But, Lee, if you want to do another podcast, I'm not doing much in the next few weeks. I've got plenty of free time. <laughs> I really love our email exchanges anyway. They're just so much fun. And shout out yeah. to Shaz. She's so awesome, isn't she? <laughs> yes. Hi, hi, Sharon, if you're listening anyway. I'm sure you, I'm sure you are because you've texted me during this conversation. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Where Sharon. The three of us are going to get – look, I don't drink alcohol, but when I see you two, we are having a whiskey. I yeah. – I just can't thank you enough for how much you've schooled us and how generously you've given of your information. A friend, a friend of mine in Paris, we said next time we catch up in Paris, we're cracking a bottle of red eaten near the Eiffel Tower. I can't. So, yes, yeah. there, there are some – let's plan looking forward to the happy times because they, they, they will happen they're again. They will happen again and we'll all be much more – I keep saying this term, we will have grown heart muscles that we didn't know that we have. Uh, mm -hmm. So, sir, please stay safe. And, and thank you for all the work that you're doing right now to educate people on what's going on. No problem. Have an amazing rest of your day. Peace, love and peanut butter, everyone. And thanks to everyone who joined us in the live chat. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye.